uh, thank you, Christian, and many thanks to, to Lucy and everyone at the Centre for Social Justice for the invitation to speak this evening. It's always great to speak at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, <laughs> perhaps the only institution that really made that the loser go to work. <laughs> so, um, and I'm also honoured by the invitation uh, because of the respect that I have for, for you, for your purpose, and for the courage that you have shown in challenging dogma within your own tradition. Most necessary on both sides. Um, Hayek, an economist and theorist I respect hugely, used to argue that putting the word social as a prefix voided the following word meaning. <laughs> so that, for example, social democracy would invariably mean that it was neither social nor democratic. <laughs> so the social market meant that there would be no market at all. And social justice would mean the opposite theft, persecution, and maladministration. <laughs> Not the least of your achievements is that you have refuted Hayek's thesis, and that you are committed to a conception of justice that includes relationships, institutions, and families, so that it is genuinely social, and that is a very notable achievement. There is also a very unusual aspect of CSJ, which is that it was born of the desire for transformation and redemption, the very foundation of the good society and the politics of the common good. <coughs> It was born of a recognition that the existing political economy, the existing system of the welfare state and the dominant financial sector was giving incentives to vice and not virtue, that it was leaving lives untransformed and unredeemed. The task of changing that is another way of talking about the transformation and redemption of our politics, of a new political consensus based upon virtue and vocation, of a strengthening of relationships and society so that we are no longer dominated by money and public sector managers, so that the City of London and Westminster are not the sole geographical sites of power, and that political and economic liberalism are not the only definers of progress against which all other traditions are viewed as reactionary. We have a good, and potentially a common good, to be pursued together. So the generation of a new political consensus around the common good must be the task of many hands, many different traditions. And we will all be required to show an uncharacteristic civility to each other. The Labour, Conservative, Catholic, Evangelical, and Civic Republican traditions have not found a decent way of talking <coughs> to each other, or even to themselves, for quite a long time. But they are the sources of nutrition out of which this new political consensus will be formed. The reconciliation of estranged interests and it's very good that the tube strike was sorted out. And the, reconcili <laughs> the reconciliation of estranged interest is fundamental to a good society and to the common good. And it is the work of no one institution alone, but in its inspiration, its expertise in policy, and its political connections, the CSJ is a very important player in the politics that is being formed. So as Christian mentioned, it's a week when Ed Miliband, John Puddas, and Liz Kendall are each making speeches about public sector reform, the centrality of relationships, the transformation of lives that comes about from relationships and the decimation of lives that comes from not having them. They will be addressing the decentralization of power, the importance of accountability, and the participation of people in public life so that they have some power and responsibility. So it is important to recognise that the new contours of a new political consensus shared between Labour and the Conservative traditions are almost visible, but also that this change will compel us out of our conflict zone. There will have to be new coalitions between religious and secular, unions and employers, public and private sector, God knows even Protestant and Catholic, so that we can invite our exiled traditions home and have them engage with each other in creating the new institutions, relationships and practices necessary to treasure quality and equality, power and responsibility, virtue and vocation, and above all, the strange combination of democracy and liberty that distinguishes the English political tradition. Most particularly, this concerns resistance to tyranny, understood as an unaccountable single interest that seeks to impose its will on others. So the common good itself is also a retrieval of a political tradition that has served our country well for over a millennia. The anniversary of Magna Carta is coming, but it has fallen into disrepute since 1945. 
It is time, perhaps, to domesticate the idea of a commonwealth that inspired the Tudor theorists before the Reformation. So it is a quirk of the new labor that we are fond of paradox. Paradox I define as something that sounds wrong but is right. And in the rationalist, tin-eared, and ungenerous Westminster village, that has sometimes led me, in particular, into trouble. <laughs> Making statements such as tradition shapes modernity, faith will redeem citizenship, trust is the basis of competition, contribution strengthens solidarity, labor power improves competitiveness, decentralization underpins patriotism, to make us sound like highly educated idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Almost giving a new meaning to oxymoron. <laughs> the paradox is, however, necessary for understanding the politics of the common good, because it will appear that strange people are in alliance, that incompatible ideas are working better together. And it is when these ideas cease to appear paradoxical, but obviously right, <coughs> that's when a political consensus has been achieved. Perhaps the most important paradox that I wish to address tonight is that the old is the new, that in interrogating our exiled political traditions we will find the sources of our renewal. We don't need a new policy, but we need a new polity which recognises the legitimacy of interests and facilitates their negotiation through renewed institutions that give incentives to virtue rather than incentives to vice. That is the politics of the common good in a nutshell. So, in order to give some definition of what a good society might look like as a means of locating the common good, it is perhaps best to ask Marvin Gaye's question of what's going on before we move to Lenin's subordinate question of what is to be done. I continue to be shocked by how Leninist our political class has become, how eager to engage in competitive activity, and how unwilling to reflect on where we find ourselves and why. What's going on? is that society is disintegrating in the face of the state and the market, which are characterized by the three Cs, centralization, concentration, and commodification. Ugly words and ugly realities, but I can't find adequate alternatives. Both the market and the state centralize power in the name of efficiency and justice. It is the tragedy of the conservative tradition since Burke but they have been unable to comprehend that the market centralizes power, concentrates wealth, and commodifies human beings and their environment. It leads to unaccountable power, and the crash of 2008, does so anybody remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Great, it seems to have gone down a whole memory hole, but the crash of 2008, that long forgotten moment of clarity when the banks received the biggest subsidy in our national history gave an indication of how far down that road we had come. There has been a decimation of our regional banking system. Not one of the demutualized building societies of the 80s and 90s still exists as an autonomous institution. I don't know if you remember them. Northern Rock, Bradford and Bingley, Halifax, the Midland Bank, all dissolved into the city of London and the big six. That is centralization, and it is also a concentration of power. Without constraints, capital turns to oligopoly. Equally important for the conservative tradition is that capital, through its pursuit of maximum returns on investment, exerts tremendous pressure to turn human beings and their natural environment into commodities that are available at a price in fluctuating markets. Unless there are countervailing institutions with genuine power that can resist this, there will be the systematic demoralization and deceit that led to the financial crash. Without institutions such as families, churches, the army, universities, vocational colleges, professional associations, and schools that are founded upon a non-pecuniary definition of the good that promote character, honesty, loyalty, skill, and faithfulness that create virtue and incentives to virtue, there will be no space between the individual maximizer and the external aggregator, the market and the state. Indeed, there will be no society at all. So the big society, I don't know if you remember that, that um, the big society founded on, it, founded on its inability to understand tradition and institutions as embodiments of the good, as countervailing forces to vice. It put all its eggs into the volunteering basket and the message got scrambled. 
That is what I meant about the challenge of the common good. It is time for the conservative tradition to recognise the weaknesses as well as the strengths of the market that manifest themselves in poverty wages, usurious interest rates, the disintegration of skills, and the subordination of character to the temptations of cheating and greed. There is a need to rediscover the virtue of institutions, local traditions and relationships, rather than an exclusive concern with maximisation of returns and quarterly balance sheets. Our economy in many ways has been voided of value and fueled by debt. A good society and a common good requires a change towards value and vocation. This leads to the challenge to labour and to its uncritical term to state administration and public spending as a default orthodoxy. In an almost exact parallel to the degradation of what is noble in the conservative tradition, Labour has at times been unable to understand how the state can undermine responsibility, <coughs> agency and participation. To understand that re redistribution without reciprocity is just another form of domination and leaves its recipients untransformed. The Labour movement was born in opposition to the free market economy and the poor law state, and under new Labour it seems that we've got both. I have received really an astonishing degree of abuse for suggesting that the biggest mistake was the 1945 government itself, which was centralising, dominated by public sector managers, and impervious to the traditions of labour and their organisations. Germany went a different way after the war, building its approach around Catholic social thought and a form of social democracy that was social and democratic. It embraced subsidiarity and federalism in its politics, a radical form of decentralisation that enabled responsibility for power to be exerted at a local level. It endowed and established regional and sectoral banks that were constrained not to lend outside their regional sector. They developed a partnership model between capital and labour in its corporate governance system that allowed for cooperation and conflict in the negotiation of interests. And they retrieved a concept of vocation that modernity had abandoned in their labour market entry that allowed for the preservation of status and skill and the reproduction of knowledge. <coughs> Family, place and work were all recognised and honoured in a way that they have not been in the <coughs> since 1945. The bitter truth is that we won the war but we have lost the peace. The good society and the politics of the common good needs to look soberly at vice and virtue and how to give incentives to the latter and not the former, as has been the case until now. Labour needs to repent of its dependence on an exclusive reliance on an administrative state and the redistribution of money, often through transfers to the private sector. Relationships, responsibility and reciprocity should be guiding principles of welfare reform, where contribution plays a central role in the renewal of solidarity. So I think enough time has been spent with Marvin Gaye, and we can conclude provisionally that 1945, 1979 and 1997 were all from storms that led to centralisation and demoralisation in our polity. <coughs> we have an economy built around debt, a stagnation of wages, a deficit that refuses to shrink, a disaffection with politics, a degradation of previously trusted institutions, amidst a backdrop of a generally subdued cow of powers outrage. That is the background of the of the discussion of what needs to be done. So a good society is based upon the balance of interests. The Queen in Parliament would be a very good model, rather than the domination of any single interest. It is underpinned by a sense that your own interests are served if there is a sense that they are tied up with the well-being of others a sense of a shared fate that can generate sacrifice and solidarity. This is not a natural condition. It is generated and sustained by the range of institutions that support the good. So a good society is also a human scale and a humane society where people can participate in having some power over their lives through working with others. We used to call it democratic politics, but we can work on the land. So the first condition of a good society is that power is decentralised, that the sense of place is restored, in which people can earn and belong to specific institutions and localities. Subsidiarity 
the exercise of power at the lowest level possible commensurate with the performance of its function, which has as its counterpart with federalism within the Republican tradition, is a necessary condition of redistributing power and responsibility, which is the condition of a good society and a common good. We also need to return <coughs> the citizenship to the city and cease talking about citizenship as having a national meaning. We are subjects of the crown, and we need to emphasize that citizenship is a civic status, but it is natural to cities. Self-governing cities with embedded universities, vocational colleges, banks, parliaments, and budgets that are governed by their citizens are part of that. You can imagine, for example, the city of London, with its mayor, guild hall, livery companies, and aldermen representing all of London, in which all London are <coughs> citizens, and where the democratically elected mayor lives in Mansion House, and the Great <coughs> Hall is London's parliament. The old is the new. Renewed country hundreds, with power and control over the countryside, is its complement. People require institutional <coughs> expression of their interests, and the power to act in the world to pursue those interests. The flooding of the West Country speaks of a lack of local power over their shared needs and a centralised power that had other concerns. Dredging rivers should be part of the local calendar and fulfilled by local people upholding their responsibility and the common good. In specific institutional and public sector reform terms, the common good can be pursued through the corporate, gov corporate governance of all schools and hospitals consisting of one third funder one-third user and one-third workforce, the three constituent parts of any institution who negotiate a common good and hold each other to account. It's the nature of relational accountability that has been missing. So in any school, a third of the seats on the governing body would be held by the funder, whether that would be the state or the local authority, a third by parents and a third by teachers. This is linked to a recognition of work and most particularly of vocation as a central aspect of the preservation of value, whether <coughs> that is understood in the determination of the price or by the ethics of the person who embodies the vocation. The importance of work and work ethic is something that the CSG has <coughs> rightly emphasized. Labour is constitutive of our humanity in terms of both childbirth and family life being in labour, so to speak, <coughs> and the transformation of things through skillful action which is the going to work meaning. So it is vital that the vocation of teaching is restored, but where is the institution that upholds the tradition, the practice, the craft of teaching, and enforces it within the sector? The answer is that there is none. That is why we need to establish a college of teaching, run by teachers, for teachers, to restore the vocation from the condition of proletarianization that has been imposed by coalition between government and the teaching union since the war. The consequences of pursuing decentralization, vocation, and the common good in education are surprising. It, require, it would require different pathways at 14 and a new respect for vocation that leads to an apprenticeship and a specific skill. It requires labor market reform that gives to plumbers the same market status as dentists and accountants. It requires a substantive reform of higher education which could involve turning half our universities into vocational colleges, run and funded by a partnership between local business, unions, and civic institutions that employ local people, such as hospitals and universities. <coughs> the generation of mutual interests, where there is now estrangement, is one way of conceptualizing this. Renewing vocation is another, but they are all contained within the meaning of the common good. So the common good will also be carried by the need for new financial institutions and the problem of debt. Pope Francis called usury the way that the rich play upon the problems of the poor. And when Barclays lent to the money shop at 7%, and the money shop begin their lending at 5,500%, I hope you get what he means. The Pope has spoken out. Justin Welby has also led courageously on this issue and wishes to build an alternative banking system through the credit union. Guy Oppen, a Conservative MP, is helping to set up a community bank in Hexham. Unite the Union is supporting the establishment of the Bank of Salford, bound to end within Salford, and has consolidated the credit union funds. The local authority is putting its payroll through it, and this is taking deposits from local people. This is all to just give you a sense 
that the politics of the common good would reconcile the church and unions in upholding the status of the person as a human being through building institutions that serve the interests of the poor. The unions could redefine themselves as having a civic function within society rather than their present exclusive concern with the Labour Party and the state. The church could fulfil its calling as an embodiment of the good. The bank would lend to local businesses who have suffered from the disintegration of the local banking system and the lack of affordable credit. Businesses, unions, churches, mosques, local authorities, all seeking a common good through the sharing of resources and local leadership and initiative. Participation, enterprise, and a renewed sense of solidarity are the results of building local institutions together, which is another way of talking about the politics of the common good. When I see Justin Welby speaking alongside Emma Plusky in the shared pursuit of the good of the city, I will know that the agenda is really taking form. The future should be shocking and full of surprises. There is plenty more to say, but I get the sense that I've really said enough. The new consensus built around the common good will be pro-business and pro-work. It will be patriotic and localist. It will be based on lower tax but higher participation, a balance of interests that facilitate negotiation. One of the paradoxes I mentioned at the beginning was the tension is necessary to <coughs> We have to learn to stay in the room and represent our interests and explore how they can be reconciled with others. The fundamental insight is that we cannot do this alone. We need relationships, institutions and other people to fulfil ourselves. We need social justice. And I'm grateful for the invitation to speak tonight and I hope that this is the beginning 